Hi, welcome back. We're going to talk about telling stories with data. This is a topic that has been pervasive over the years since I started in the space almost 20 years ago. And it's been really difficult um, in many cases for people to put a coherent narrative together that inspires intentional positive change. So what's before you is a very simple narrative. And I came from a retail background. I also worked in the energy industry and banking and, and other sectors. Uh, that being said, retail is a very simple, understandable example for people. At least so was retail is obviously getting um, you know, turned upside down. But here we have onboarding investment, driving associate engagement, driving customer satisfaction, and in turn sales. And what's below is a very simple narrative around how these interact. So let me step back and explain how we got here. Because something that we should all understand, whether we're an HR business partner, people analytics professional, business leader, and I'm going to reference Steven Pinker, who led the psychology department at um, Harvard for many years, wrote a wonderful book called The Blank Slate, which has been a, an inspiration for me. But he talks about, and others do as well, stories being the cognitive building blocks of thought. In other words, we reference stories to build our own narratives. So then it invites the question, you know, what stories are we hearing over and over again? And we're going to reference that in our next section around cognitive bias. But it's also the case where if we're analytics professionals or HR business partners trying to influence change. What stories are we telling and are they adequately supported by data and insights that in turn inspire confidence and appropriate change? So when I was uh, working at Ernst & Young in the early 90s, I was steeped in the balance core card framework. And if you're not familiar with it, it's built on four dimensions, a financial dimension on how to look at an organization's uh, performance, an external customer or customer or market perspective, as well as an internal operations perspective. Now, Norton and Kaplan, uh, two Harvard business professors, the creators of the balance core card, had a fourth quadrant called learning and growth. Now, given me being audacious young professional, I said, you know, that doesn't really you know, hit home for me. And so I changed that to leaders, managers, and the workforce for my own purposes. Uh, because as I was advising companies and I had founded my own company, um, which by the way, was a water company in the former Soviet Union, I was really interested in how our people actually impacted the customer experience and in turn financial outcomes. And I was further curious as to how HR the policies that I was putting in place, how they were affecting the associates in our company, which was Chiste Vada or Clearwater. And uh, ultimately, how are we as leaders driving that change, both in terms of the policies and resources and technologies that we're putting forth, but also through our behaviors and our communications and what have you. So here we have a model around how these different constructs can uh, fit together. Great. But here's the thing. I have, like you potentially have been asked, well, how are these HR programming, programs driving financial performance? Something to be very aware of right up front. There are a host of what I call intermediary variables between the HR actions and technologies and data and insights and, and certainly the people with those financial outcomes. Depending on the nature of your industry, the weather, uh, the general economy can affect those financial outcomes more than the people in this causal chain here. That being said, can we tighten up the causal chain to tell a more confidence inspiring narrative? Yes, we can, but we have to do so consciously. So if I look at these questions, what are the outcomes you as an organization are trying to achieve? And they can be very relevant, obviously, to what's happening in the world right now. What do you require from the workforce to achieve those outcomes? What risk do you see? What will help, help mitigate those risks? What can HR, talent management, talent acquisition, org design, et cetera, do? Now, if we take these questions and uh, underlay, in this case, the framework that we've just discussed, we can start putting these 
these constructs together. And I use that term constructs intentionally because within these constructs or ideas, there's a host of policies, procedures, and data that we can harness. And this data ultimately is going to serve as a proxy for something, rarely as an absolute. And I'll talk about that as we start to wrap up. But going back to the retail example, uh, there's been much to do around what store managers did to drive the performance in that particular store. And as I'm saying this out loud, I'm realizing how, like, I don't want to say dated this is, but how much this is going to change uh, moving forward and how much it's already uh, changed. Because managers used to be th thought of, okay, as the, the end all, they drive and they influence so much. They influence, among other things, how the associates feel and how they act and how they prioritize within their day-to-day -day work. They also, however, uh, try and drive customer satisfaction, net promoter score, or whatever the metric is for that particular organization, keeping in mind that what we're talking about here is what economists call an open system. Meaning a closed system is like a Petri dish where there's only one thing. If you poke a cell and it moves, then what drove that cell to move? Well, you poking it. There was no other influence on that particular cell, for example. However, in an open system, what's driving customer behavior? There's a whole host of things that are driving customer behavior. You know, did they get a good parking spot? Was it, uh, are people wearing masks in, inside the store? Did they have uh, traffic coming in? Uh, what's the general state of the, the economy in that particular region? There are so many variables impacting customer behavior. We cannot possibly, through our work, account for them all. However, we can be aware of them and treat the model appropriately. In other words, we're going to have to be comfortable with probabilities, certain amounts of error, and um, ultimately, it's not going to be certain. We have to uproot our appetite for certainty and say, hey, this is giving us a good idea, better insight and ideas that we had uh, before when we did not do this analysis. So we cannot, however, just say, okay, A plus B equals C. No, it's because A, it, the environment A exists. If we do B, then the probability C ensues is going to be X. You know, so we have to, again, be comfortable with probabilities. So if we go back to our model, we have, okay, we want to increase profitability in this uh, stage. And we have, you know, we got to increase sales to do that. We got to elevate customer satisfaction. We got to do all these things. Now, if we do what Jim Collins and others talked about, the four whys or five whys, well, or hows rather, if you want to increase profitability, well, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to increase sales. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to have more customers. Well, how are we going to do that? You get the idea. We go further and further upstream to understand the dynamics that are going to drive that outcome that we want. So if we do that under this model, it's a big mess, right? <laughs> so if we underlay the framework, however, now we can start to make sense of it. And this is very powerful. This helps us understand how these actually put together. And we ask the very basic questions. Do we have data that underlie these constructs? If not, then can we go get that data uh, through a survey, through a new technology that we implement? Uh, do we, can we acquire that data externally? Who knows? But unless we have a framework by which to put these constructs together, we are dealing with that previous slide where things are all over the place. It's a bunch of noise and we don't get where we want to go. So there's more to share. There's steps to take, certainly underneath um, these, these bubbles here. But again, this gives you an idea of how to tell that coherent narrative in this final example. Hey, how does onboarding affect associate engagement? How does that affect leader effectiveness, customer satisfaction, sales, and increased probability downstream? Again, these, this is an interconnected ecosystem. We have to understand that. At the end of the day, we're talking about probabilities um, for you uh, geeks out there like me. This leverages causal pathway analysis or structural equation modeling. So the, particularly in, given what's happening now in the world, in some industries, we actually do it better than we were able to historically because there's more data exhaust, there's more data to grab. In other cases, it's actually more difficult. So but this is, again, this is a mental model. We have to understand how to use it, know its limitations. But ultimately, this is a way we can 
connect HR with operations, with finance and, and others in the organization. So I hope you found this helpful. So now we're going to take a quick break and we're going to talk a bit about cognitive bias. So talk to you in a few minutes.